Um, to formally then welcome everybody to the uh, second installment of our um, weekly webinars. And as we said at the last one last week, um, we were going to try and uh, focus on various different aspects and different specialties and different issues that are arising um, during the current crisis. Uh, I suppose I may open by asking uh, or hoping that everybody is doing well, that their families are doing well, that their colleagues are doing well. Um, it's again extraordinary times um, we're uh, adapting uh, uh, every single day, I think, to the new reality that we find ourselves in. But I do hope everybody is staying as safe as they possibly can. Um, this, this week we're going to focus on uh, trauma and orthopaedics. And uh, we have uh, two speakers, uh, uh, Mr. David Moore, who's a council member of the RCSI, who's chair of ISPTC, the training committee. Um, and uh, is uh, is um, uh, also the national lead for the National Clinical Programme in Trauma and Orthopaedics, uh, along with Mr. Paddy Kenny. And uh, we're also then joined by Professor John O'Byrne, uh, who's a professor in RCSI and a, uh, an orthopaedic surgeon uh, too. So, and then uh, we'll open the session uh, by inviting uh, our president, uh, Mr. Ken Mealy, to uh, give us an update on the various things that have been going on since uh, he was last on here. And uh, I suppose primarily looking at some of the more recent kind of topical matters that are uh, affecting uh, surgery in Ireland at the moment. And um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to the president and uh, take it from there. So president, if you don't unmute your mic and if everybody else could stay muted, that'd be great. Sure, and thank you very much. And likewise, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the webinar this evening. Um, as Kieran has said, we, we feel that on a weekly basis, we should um, ask different specialties to take part in the webinar and update their own uh, colleagues regarding issues specific for their specialty. And from time to time, there may be other specific topics that we feel would be appropriate to bring to you. Um, I, I, and so we'll update with you, you uh, on a week by week basis with uh, th those topics. And we'd ask for your feedback uh, regarding topics that you may need some help with or that uh, topics that you'd like to hear a bit more about. Um, I'd like to start this evening by some talking about some generic issues. Uh, and again, we would think this would be appropriate to do this on a weekly basis. And, and the topics that I want to cover uh, our uh, generic to all specialties, and that's some of the safety issues. We talked about these uh, uh, last week. I also want to talk and update you about some of the training issues, which will be relevant to a lot of our trainees and trainers. And then I want to talk a little bit about clinical practice. Uh, to start off then, in terms of safety, um, a lot actually is happening behind the scenes. We work uh, with our intercollegiate partners uh, in London, Edinburgh and Glasgow. And uh, from time to time, we update uh, the criteria that we use uh, in terms of advising surgeons uh, as to um, their working practices during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have adjusted uh, the intercollegiate statement regarding safety and PPE uh, in the last uh, week in particular in relation to laparoscopy. Um, we have had some more feedback from various organizations uh, around the world. Uh, SAGES have recently updated their uh, criteria uh, for safety in relation to laparoscopy. And there's a stronger emphasis now on using clinical judgment as to what might be appropriate, whether one engages in laparoscopic or open surgery. And this is in relation to using filters uh, the release of aerosols during, the, during the, the, the surgical process. So we would ask you to look at those again and, and consider carefully what is in the best interest of yourselves, your patients and your team members. Um, we also work closely with our other professional bodies here in Ireland and in particular with the College of Physicians and the College of Anesthetists. We're uh, involved in ongoing discussions with the HSE here and Colin Henry's office in relation to uh, criteria for the use of full PPE. Uh, all of the professional bodies are very clear uh, in the requirement for full PPE for any aerosol generating procedures. And uh, by those, we mean any intubation, extubation, pulmonary toilet, anybody undergoing surgery, 
uh, upper GI endoscopies and bronchoscopies, maxillofacial surgery, dental surgery, and ENT surgery are procedures. We believe all of these are aerosol generating. <clears throat> and there's a consensus amongst all of the professional bodies here that we should advise our uh, members and fellows accordingly. So we would draw your attention to that. Um, in terms of safety, I would also ask you to consider very strongly our commitment to our teams, in particular our junior uh, trainees uh, and our interns. It really is important as, as senior clinical leaders that we demonstrate a, 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 an awareness for looking after those who are really in the front line, and in many cases more so uh, than uh, more senior people such as myself. Uh, it is important that all our trainees uh, undergo proper instruction in relation to uh, putting on and taking off uh, the PPE uh, equipment. Um, it's important that they understand the social distancing that's required within hospitals, not just in the clinical concept, uh, in context, but also uh, uh, in, in downtime in the hospitals when they're relaxing with colleagues and so forth. The, the social distancing is so important because it's clear from the feedback that we are getting from the HSE that a significant proportion of healthcare worker uh, COVID positive uh, tests are relate, related to peer infection uh, rather than uh, patient contact. So patient, uh, team safety, uh, fellow and member safety is really paramount. And, and we would stress this and will continue to do so. I'd like now just to update you a little bit on the training. Again, in terms of working with the forum of postgraduate training bodies, we have a universal consensus that the rotations uh, should commence uh, this year uh, in July, and we will uh, push the HSE to uh, agree with this uh, uh, principle. Uh, we feel very strongly that ST1, 2 and 3 years, uh, the rotation should rotate uh, because there is some discussion uh, around the country that perhaps uh, trainees in post should not rotate because it may destabilize the system and to maybe issues in relation to a uh, spread of infection if the COVID crisis is, is still in existence at that time. And many of us are of the opinion that it will be uh, still with us and there would still need to be precautions taken. Uh, but we feel strongly that uh, to uh, accept the new inter uh, cohort of ST1s, uh, our junior trainees at ST2 and 3 will also will, will really need to rotate. Uh, we're open to um, ongoing discussion with the other professional bodies and the forum of postgraduate training bodies as to whether uh, we should have uh, rotations, uh, continuing rotations in the summer for the specialty uh, uh, groups. Uh, and it, it may be that uh, some of the more senior trainees in ST456, uh, 7 may need to stay in post for longer but we'll update you with that once we get a consensus from the other professional bodies and from the HSE. Uh, there are some concerns regarding trainees that are currently in ST8. Uh, we know we have 32 trainees across all specialties who will exit their training program. These all are, will have a, a completed CCST. Uh, they all have exams and many of them have planned on going on fellowship. And we aren't clear as yet as to whether it will be possible for uh, these uh, the trainees to go on fellowship. And we are exploring with uh, the HSE and the Department of Health whether we can organize uh, that these trainees are offered uh, uh, locum or temporary consultant posts uh, in this country for at least one year uh, so that following the COVID crisis, they may decide then at a later date, if they cannot travel to fellowship uh, this year, perhaps they could defer it for a year. But we're very keen to uh, have uh, these trainees appropriately uh, employed in, in the intervening year. So we, over the coming weeks, we will have uh, more details regarding that. Um, 
and we will update you. Uh, but any trainee who is ST8, uh, to be aware, they will be contacted by our Department of Surgical Affairs to see what their intentions are in terms of fellowship and to try and get uh, an up-to-date uh, account as to what will happen with those fellowships. Um, we're not clear as to what's going to happen with the Inter uh, International Medical Graduates Training uh, Initiative. Uh, it may not be possible for us to have a new cohort of international medical graduates uh, from Pakistan and the Sudan this year. And again, we will update uh, all of the trainers and the uh, hospitals uh, in the coming weeks when we have a bit more clarity in this regard. Personally, I think it may be problematic uh, for uh, trainees to travel here in June, the end of June, early July, uh, with an appropriate work visa, uh, have access to international travel, and to be able to organize accommodation because of the time constraints. But as I say, we will update you in due course. The third uh, point I would like to update you uh, regarding it, it regards clinical practice. Um, I've already alluded to the fact that uh, the clinical statements that we make in terms of um, uh, safety and clinical practice is updated uh, frequently. Um, and I would ask all of you to keep uh, an eye on our website because we're encouraging each of our specialty, uh, each of our specialty uh, bodies to uh, update uh, the details they're giving us. Uh, and we are conscious that we may overload uh, you with uh, excessive information, but we do update uh, the guidelines coming from the different specialties from time to time. And uh, I think that's important. I've alluded to the fact that uh, we have amended our guidelines in relation to general surgery and laparoscopy, uh, uh, putting in place a greater emphasis on uh, uh, personal clinical judgment. Um, and we will do this from time to time uh, as uh, criteria in terms of safety change around the world. Um, last uh, week, uh, Debbie McNamara gave an update on the National Clinical Programme in Surgery. Um, uh, just to, to confirm that the GP surgeon con uh, Surgeons Connect program has started. Many of the other specialties are taking part in this, and we would hope that this would uh, build in the coming weeks. Uh, the feedback we've got from uh, GPs around the country is that they look upon this as a valuable exercise, and it gives them a resource which they don't have in many cases locally because they don't have access uh, to uh, uh, outpatient clinics and access to their own uh, um, consultants in their local hospitals. Um, the final thing I want to mention is that we are in negotiation with the Department of Health, the HSE, and the National Treatment Purchase Fund to see how we can put a structure on the contract that the HSE has with the private health sector, uh, which really shouldn't be looked upon as the private health sector for the next three months at least, because it has been commandeered by uh, the HSE. And really what we're trying to do is work out a, an appropriate governance structure, referral process, and data collection for semi-urgent and time-dependent uh, operations, which we believe will need to, to be increasingly transferred into those private hospitals as capacity uh, becomes uh, further constrained in, in, in the public hospitals. So we would hope to have more information in this regard in, 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 the, in the next week or two, and we'll update you uh, on that uh, as we get uh, more information. So those are the three areas that uh, I just want to update you on. Um, I wish all of you well. Uh, I thank you again for tuning in to this webinar. We believe it is an important process in which we can communicate with our members and fellows. And as always, we uh, welcome your feedback uh, in regard to any specific questions that you may have. We welcome your feedback in uh, relation to any thoughts and ideas you have in managing issues that have ar ar arisen for you, because we would like to share best practice uh, with all our colleagues around the country. So I hope you and your families and colleagues all remain well. And I'll hand you back to Kira now as we continue with the program. Thank you for listening to me.
Thank you very much, uh, President. Uh, that was a, a great update. And just to remind everybody, we use the chat function on the uh, the webinar platform here to send in any questions you might have. So if you have questions, uh, by all means, send them in. Um, we'll then put them to the panel at the end. Uh, and they can be a, 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 any topic at all. Um, if, of course, the, the speakers are covering some of the areas that you're, you're working on, we, we don't necessarily need to go there uh, again. So um, uh, to just uh, introduce the next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. David Moore. In, it was said as the uh, orthopedic surgeon and uh, is on council, is the chair of the Irish uh, Surgical uh, Postgraduate Training Committee and is the national co-lead for the National Clinical Programme in Trauma and Orthopaedics. And I think this is an important update uh, for people to hear what's happening, the services. Many, I suppose, who are at the coalface are, are, are see what's going on and how things are being reorganised. Um, and while there's an awful lot of focus on COVID uh, patients being treated in our, in our hospitals, uh, all the other illnesses, uh, diseases, injuries and so on are still going to materialise in the population and looking at how the services are orientating themselves to be able to provide uh, the, the service to those groups of patients is, is a key uh, thing to look at. Um, so um, David will uh, give us an update on what's happening there with the clinical programme and a range of different um, uh, programmes that they're working on uh, on your behalf. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks, Kieran. Um, thanks, Ken. Uh, could you just put on the first slide, Kieran, please? Okay, so I'm going to um, just give a brief update of some of the things that are happening um, and that people might uh, consider paying attention to. Uh, next slide, please, Kieran. And um, this update is on behalf of the uh, National Programme in Trauma and Orthopaedics, of which I'm co-lead with Paddy Kenny and Catherine Farrell is the programme manager and Neve Keane is the um, project manager. Next slide, please. So uh, everybody knows that plan suspended and I'll come back to that at the very end but really um, for the present uh, what we're talking about is uh, acute practice and trauma. Everyone is aware that there are guidance documents available um, on the RCSI website. I'm not going to discuss those um, because they're available for people to review themselves. The surgical pathway I'm going to leave to Professor John O'Byrne really to discuss um, in his talk and what I'm going to cover um, concentrate on are the other issues of uh, prioritizing what patients we look at. We'll discuss some things about outpatient clinics, what happens if the situation escalates, and the alternative, what happens when we have the ability to start restoring our previous services. And then I'll finish just by talking very briefly about protection of patients and staff. Uh, next slide, please. So from the point of view of prioritis prioritization, really what we're trying to do is um, free up facilities for our colleagues in critical care. That's really what we're doing. We're trying to make available uh, to them resources in the hospital and that we kind of move elsewhere to carry out our trauma. Ideally, the whole aim of this is that we will improve the adult mortal mortality of patients who uh, experience COVID-19. Maybe one way of considering what would we uh, think is a successful outcome metric after this whole crisis would be to look at the lowest sum of, our, of adult mortality and the non-infective morbidity, including that due to trauma and orthopedics. But I do think it, it is recognize that we will have to accept some degree of temporary societal damage uh, due to the practice al alterations that we will have to uh, work under and that these will cause orthopedic morbidity. Next slide, please. So from the point of view of trauma, um, I'm not going to go through any particular conditions, but the question that you need to ask if you're going to bring a patient to theater, it's not whether they might benefit from the surgery, but what other resources are we going to use up, whether it's personnel or equipment, and are we going to add to uh, the risk of caregivers and patients by bringing them to theater? So first of all, you need to decide, is there a conservative option 
that will get you an acceptable or satisfactory result? Is there a non-aerosol generating procedure option? Um, and in other words, can you use a cast rather than some type of metal fixation? And when you're making these decisions, consider the value of making it with your colleagues. Because if there are problems that arise down the line, it would be helpful that you don't have to carry the can for everything, uh, an, an individual decision that hasn't worked out so well, that you share that with your colleagues. And it's also important that people may um, be on rotas whereby one surgeon admits a, a patient for a particular um, procedure, uh, but then another surgeon is the one who's actually going to carry it out. So having a, a regular um, joint uh, decision-making conference with your colleagues is important. Obviously, priority still exists for patients with cord compromise, with infection, with malignancy, whether primary or metastatic disease. And then in everyone's individual areas of practice, you may be able to identify cases that can't be postponed. And obviously that um, decision needs to be made in conjunction with your anesthet anesthetic staff, your theater staff, and your administration staff to see that the facilities are actually available. Next slide, please. When we come to clinics, um, it's easy to say postpone your elective clinics, but uh, what we've done in one of the hospitals I work in is we've just made the decision to uh, postpone everything for two months. But when you do that, you still need to get out the charts of all the patients who've been postponed and review them to decide how those patients should be managed. Is it reasonable for them to wait two months or possibly longer? Or do you need to contact them? If so, how urgent is it? Do you need to bring them back for a face-to-face -face consultation? Can you do something over the telephone or can you do a telemedicine consultation, which I'll discuss a little bit further in a moment. Clearly, priority needs to be given to post-op patients who maybe have had surgical intervention um, or the position of their fracture uh, needs to be um, uh, checked. And um, fracture clinics themselves may need to run, but again, it's worthwhile reviewing the charts, seeing how many of these are routine reviews that are coming back, perhaps not necessary, and can you um, call them, defer their appointment, or perhaps discharge them altogether. Consider um, having direct access to your fracture clinic, rather than patients have to get into a queue and wait when they're seen in the emergency department, um, if you're running daily fracture clinics, which uh, might be necessary to allow dilution of patients and their families in the waiting rooms, it might help to run more frequent fracture clinics, but have less at them. And if so, can you create direct access for patients who were seen the day previously in the uh, emergency department? Ideally, if manpower allows, the fracture clinics not only should be consultant led, but ideally consultant provided, because we know that the discharge rate of patients is about 46% if a consultant is at it, but it's only about 25% if a consultant isn't present at the clinic. And also consider, can you have an enhanced discharge policy? Can you say, well, okay, look, uh, this is not something that Ideally, we might like to, see, like to see the patient, but it's not essential. Therefore, we'll either postpone it or cancel it. Next slide, please. If you're going to consider doing a telemedicine clinic, uh, I think a lot of people have started doing them in somewhat ad hoc basis. And I think it's important that you recognize that in time to come, we'll be judged not just by what um, restrictions are uh, imposed on us now, but what the standard of normal care would be. And therefore, it's important to consider the regulation under which we practice and to make sure that your telemedicine clinic is GDPR compliant. Make sure that you document everything. Um, it's worthwhile having a preamble when you uh, discuss with any patient whether it's appropriate for you to talk to them um, over the telephone or over a Zoom conference or a Skype conference. Um, that you explain to them that there are some limitations to the, uh, to the consultation under these circumstances and make sure that you get their consent and document everything in the chart. 
it's probably not suitable for patients um, to attend a telemedicine clinic if they have to be examined to um, optimize their care or if they are very complex cases. Um, one uh, issue that um, we're looking at in one of the hospitals I work in and which one of my colleagues has trialed extremely successfully is we all have quite a bit of free time from um, uh, not having dedicated theater lists or outpatient clinics. And um, I, Ms. Paula Kelly, um, one of my colleagues, arranged to uh, do a telephone consultation with 20 patients who were on her long waiting outpatient list and was able to discharge 18 of them um, in a, a one in a period of two hours. So given that our waiting lists are so long, this is certainly something that people can consider uh, once they find that their um, hospital can organize that for them. Next slide, please. So um, for a long time, we've been trying to roll out trauma assessment clinics nationally under um, uh, Own Sheen's leadership. And this is certainly a situation where uh, a crisis is giving us the opportunity to um, allow different centers who haven't been running these, clinic, these clinics to um, set them up, see their value. And I think most people will be absolutely convinced of the fact that these should be an enduring type of clinic once this crisis is over. Very important to understand that these can only run if you have um, excellent engagement with your emergency department colleagues, that you have to have protocols agreed and you have to have both splints and soft cast available in the emergency department for this to work well. Ideally, these are consultant delivered, but there are many different ways of actually uh, running the clinic and Owen will be able to advise everybody on that. Documentation is really that you need to document everything you do, but it's also important that the, the documentation on which successful trauma assessment clinics rely should be available for patients in your emergency department. So next slide, please, Kieran. Um, when, if this situation escalates and our reduced theater time becomes more of a, a a problem, we may be reduced to seven day a week operating or nighttime operating. It was interesting listening to an EFORT webinar on Monday night and um, listening to the experience in both Spain and Italy, where in some centers they went from having eight orthopedic theaters to zero orthopedic theaters and ending up having to operate at night. And um, the only uh, what they found was that their hip fracture rate did not change, that their low velocity trauma didn't change. A lot of those were happening around the household. Their high velocity trauma certainly did change because the road accidents and sporting activities weren't occurring. Staff availability will obviously influence um, what will happen in the future. So while you might have theater availability uh, available, you may not have either anesthetists or nursing staff available. If ultimately you can't provide the service, where can it be provided? Where might you transfer your care to? Would it be somewhere um, if you're uh, outside Dublin to one of the private hospitals. Um, if you're in Dublin, is it going to be somewhere like Kappa? And I'll leave uh, John O'Byrne discuss that in detail. Just one point on pediatrics, if centres around the country begin to run into problems with their anaesthetists in particular, um, not being happy to put some of, the, of their smaller or younger patients asleep, then uh, it is open to them to contact either us in Crumlin or our colleagues in Temple Street who would be delighted to oblige if um, facilities are available, which we, we would hope that they would be. Next slide, please. And the opposite, obviously, of an escalation is that we need to start thinking about, at some stage, planning for restoration of services. This is not something that will be just like switching on um, the uh, opening the floodgates, but rather just gently switching on the tap to see um, uh, will the improved circumstances actually be maintained. So 
we are aware that in our specialty, we will have non-infected casualties of the pandemic, those who um, incur some type of disability as a result of an injury, or because of delayed treatment of their, what would have been considered their planned or elective um, problem. And also patients who uh, maybe cannot be treated optimally now would uh, develop malunions and need to be treated. Bear in mind that prior to the COVID crisis, um, orthopedics was responsible for 12% of the national um, outpatient waiting list with just around 65,000 patients waiting. And we know that there's about 1,400 patients a month added to our waiting lists. So that's a problem uh, that is only going to get worse. And similarly, we um, are responsible for 15% of the inpatient and day case surgery waiting list. And again, that's going to climb like in all other specialties. Now is probably the time for people to consider um, compiling a list of patients that they consider urgent that when facilities do return, that um, they'll be able to efficiently start looking at those and treating those patients who urgently require uh, surgery. This obviously will be influenced by manpower that's available and by the facilities that are available. Um, remember that we will be competing for resources. Uh, the HSE is going to spend an awful lot of money on uh, looking after people suffering from COVID-19 and um, the uh, cupboard is going to be pretty bare after this. So we will be competing for resources. Also because um, there will be concern about a recurrence of the COVID crisis. We will need to um, work under maybe ongoing delays in theatre um, with uh, longer times between cases because of the anaesthetic practices that are necessary during the COVID crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is my uh, second last slide. Um, just briefly uh, talking about protection patients and staff. Uh, there are guideline doc documents on the RCSI uh, website, both from our program and from the National Clinical Program in Surgery. Um, a lot of the documents are synergistic and refer to uh, surgery in general. And Professor Debbie McNamara and John Highland have um, got uh, some excellent uh, information on their program's website that I would encourage people to uh, consult. This is a stressful time for everybody. Uh, orthopedic surgeons are not necessarily in the front, front line, certainly not consultants are um, more senior uh, SPRs. Um, but we need to be considerate for everybody, for ourselves, for our colleagues, and understand that some people will handle stress better than others. Some people will be in far more stressful situations than others. And, you know, very simply, try and be kind and understanding uh, with your colleagues. At the same time, uh, maybe it's a time to reflect and say, well, are we doing the best that we can with our available resources? Just a word on workforce planning. We've all, um, at this stage, probably considered, depending on local resources, uh, we've looked at seeing, well, um, have we got uh, um, teams or pods running uh, in the hospital? Or have we any people out sick or self-isolating or being redeployed? And in some bigger units, it's uh, easy to have teams and pods. But in smaller units, it might be that the uh, orthopedic consultant is the person who's down seeing injuries, lacerations, tendon injuries and fractures in the emergency department. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, um, just a word, and I know um, uh, Ken Mealy um, referred to it as well, is that um, the NCHDs have additional stresses to those uh, that everyone else is facing, such as work and um, illness or redeployment. And that is the concern about whether the rotations will happen in July. And hopefully the default position is that they will happen. Um, people will have to consider if they are rotating or not rotating. Is there accommodation available? Can they sign the lease they were going to consider? Have they any kids starting in schools in September um, that were going, they had thought was going to be in a different city or town? So, you know, there are added stresses that our NCHD colleagues 
um, both those on the training programs and not on the training programs experience. Also, the issue of their logbooks, they're not getting the number of cases done that they would otherwise need. And it's important that they understand that all that will be taken into account um, when their annual assessments come around. And it's not something that they should fret about. Similarly, those preparing for exams, um, that um, has all been disrupted. And obviously, as time goes on, that will be addressed as much as, uh, as, um, uh, as we can. From the point of view of teaching in orthopedics, uh, we have a good structured core curriculum program, and that's obviously gone by the wayside now. But both Rory McNichol, who looks after the core curriculum program, and Owen Sheen, the director of training, um, are working on coming up with uh, small group teaching sessions um, and are gradually recruiting their colleagues from around the country to deliver that. And finally, um, which Ken has also referred to, so I won't go into it, is the uncertainty for people who are due to travel abroad after their training here uh, to uh, start their fellowships, which really would be, uh, will have long term implications if they can't start those. Um, and that's it. Last slide, please, uh, Kieran. And finally, this will end. So hopefully all these disruptions are temporary. Um, but uh, for the moment, um, I would wish everybody well. Thank you. Uh, David, thank you very much for that. Um, a really comprehensive overview and lots of good advice there on how people can try and manage their, uh, their, their services uh, during this crisis. And interestingly, some of the uh, important points that are being observed as the impact of this crisis comes to mind. And I, I have to say, I really appreciate you bringing up the idea of we have to start planning for the other end of this. Um, not sure though, ending a slide uh, deck with the, this too will end um, is, is the way to go because I guess everyone wonders that all presentations will end. But um, the uh, John O'Burn is a professor at RCSI and um, is uh, is going to give us an overview of ha what's happened uh, with uh, Kappa Hospital in particular and how the, they've gone from a, an elective hospital to a trauma unit in a matter of days and uh, how that's come about, how the organization that works. I think it'll be a very useful example around the country uh, as the uh, crisis starts to take a grip uh, uh, across the services. So John, uh, I'll hand you over to, to, to uh, present uh, what, what you guys have been doing over there. Thanks. Uh, okay, thanks, Kieran. Uh, if I could have the first slide put up there, please. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this. I mean, it is what what it has been described as being. It was uh, just converting uh, Kappa, which was recently formally rebranded as the National Orthopaedic Hospital, and then approximately ten days later, then took on this role as a fracture management and trauma management hospital. But um, it is, I guess, some of the lessons that are applicable to redirecting a hospital and all its resources uh, are applicable to other hospitals, which now may have to redirect and slightly change their, their focus. Um, so could I have the next slide, please? Um, so there's the background. Uh, I think it is uh, well known that, that uh, Kappa as the National Orthopaedic Hospital has got busier and busier and busier over the years. And in fact, just prior to this, it was, if you like, at its most successful and most busy. Uh, almost 2,000 hips and knees, uh, several 65 overnight cases a week, 100 day cases, 47 inpatient beds with very short hospital stay, very low infection rate, high radiology service. Our theatre capacity, uh, two days a week we'd run five lists and the other days four lists. Pre-assessment clinics, uh, OPD clinics, very busy elective orthopaedic hospital, but no nighttime work and no weekend work and no trauma, and any emergencies predominantly uh, would be transferred out. So that was the whole uh, focus and level of activity. Uh, next slide, please. So then it was realized the first case then was in 29th of February, and the first death was on the 11th of March. Uh, on the schools closed on the 12th of March, and uh, on the 16th of March, we had a meeting to uh, try and prepare for what we uh, anticipated would be likely to happen in the general hospitals. And the focus of that was to try and unload the general hospitals of their fracture management. Uh, it was always realized from the start that we would never take the high velocity patient, both bone, both femurs fractured, a widened mediastinum, rib fractures. Those patients were never 
uh, and won't be coming to CAFA. However, it was decided to start off with routine ambulatory trauma and work up from there and then start taking hip fractures and then maybe accept ambulances directly to, to CAFA uh, as the situation would progress. So I'll, I'll just sort of talk you through the different, um, I suppose, challenges and the different areas that required uh, attention in order to uh, re-modify and reconfigure the hospital. So next slide, please. So obviously, there's a few different people and a few different areas that need to be focused on if you're changing everything about a, a practice and a treatment of any condition. In this case, it's fractures. What is the referring hospital? In this case, the referring orthopedic surgeons who are initially responsible for the care of the patient. So the patient presents to them and they are now responsible for that patient. Um, in many of the hospitals, and particularly as they emptied out in preparation for the COVID crisis, Many surgeons found that this was the easiest time they ever had to treat patients because there was no delay in, a, in the emergency department. There was a bed readily available and theatre was quiet. So in some hospitals, it was a, a bit of a surprise, if you like, that we were uh, uh, reaching out to them to say that we were developing this service and that we did really want referrals because initially we wanted referrals at, at a low trickle rate, if you like, in order to get used to doing these cases, that the staff would get used to it, that we'd work out the algorithms and pathways without suddenly waiting until the last minute till we reached a deluge. So some of the hospitals, some of the orthopedic surgeons were referring patients to for treatment in Kappa when they felt that they possibly could have accommodated them and had capacity in, the, in their base hospital. So obviously it affected them, the orthopedic residents, the administrative staff, uh, the theatre staff, because some of the sets that would be traditionally used in the trauma hospitals then were being sent over to, to Kappa. Obviously, infectious disease team in the referring hospital had a key role to play, as you can imagine. Next slide. The patient journey then was a lot of communication to the patient who had uh, uh, arrived in an emergency department, which could be quite far away from, from Kappa in terms of uh, Dublin uh, and could be uh, something that they didn't expect. So it was explained to them and they were given very clear instructions about what to do and where to go. Um, the next next slide. Then I suppose the uh, thing that we really had to, to change was the accepting hospital, in this case, CAPA, obviously. So there had to be very clear communication to the accepting surgeon and the anaesthetist, because the traditional uh, setup in CAPA is that patients would be seen in a pre-assessment clinic. They'd been very well known, they'd be very well screened, then they'd be booked in for same day admission and it, the, the lists would usually flow very smoothly. And this was a different situation that somebody would show up in an, an emergency room and be in CAPA a few hours later. So clearly the whole communication uh, of clinical information and all the rest and that everybody was happy with it as we ramped it up, uh, that everybody was happy was, was really important. The residents, obviously, they're key as, as we all understand, so much communication and preparation and organization takes place at that level. The administrative staff of both hospitals, nursing administration, obviously key. Uh, theatre staff, and for us, it is uh, a change of equipment, a change of uh, implants. So huge thing, a few days after it, there were companies in removing uh, implants for elective orthopaedics as different uh, implant companies brought in trauma sets. Uh, trauma coordinators, a different person each day. And the other thing, as has been mentioned before, as much as we safely can and as we should do. So and it's important to record all of this. And even things like uh, hospital security and reception have to be notified as an infection control and coordinator. All of these uh, people had to be involved in, in this, uh, this process. Um, as well as the whole thing about identifying isolation protocols for suspected infected cases and identifying the whole issue of their, their COVID status, if you like. Then IT and radiology, obviously, very, very important to be involved in the process before it starts and as it expands. And next slide, please. So then this was the uh, algorithm that was established, and uh, this was uh, with uh, with um, all the different people involved in developing it. Um, so this is the sort of a Kappa trauma algorithm that was sent out first of all. and. Um, there were clear instructions given about the referral um, what was to be included on the referral details. There was clear instructions about the communication and the inclusion criteria that you can see at the start were quite modest, if you like, in that they were ASA, initially ASA 1 and 2. Um, 
and ambulatory trauma. Um, as the time went on, that changed and the inclusion criteria has expanded. And I'll, I'll, I'll just elaborate on that uh, shortly. We use the silo app and this is an encrypted, quite safe app. Again, like Zoom, like a lot of these things, I hadn't really heard about it two weeks ago. Now it is just something that we're using all the time. So the information is transferred, including all the imaging and videos and whatever else needs to be done, sent from the referring hospital to the uh, to Kappa, where the information can be examined. The, one of the issues was that we, we had decided early on that we would just send medical information. We, there wouldn't be a situation where you'd have an anesthetic review of a patient in Beaumont, for example, because it is anticipated and expected that the anesthetist there will be too busy. Next slide, Kieran. Very uh, slides there. Um, Uh, no, previous slide, Kieran. So, John, we're having a, a bit of trouble with your um, if with it's your, your your voice. So maybe if you uh, mute the camera and just talk, it can give you a better bandwidth, oh, okay. um, so that we don't have any trouble in the speech. Okay. All right. Is that better? Is that better? Yes, John. That's great. Perfect. All right. Sorry about that. So this is the detailed trauma pathway with all the instructions very clearly given and how to who to communicate with, how to uh, send the information, what information to send. Uh, there's quite detailed pathway there in the uh, National Orthopaedic Hospital Trauma Center, as we are calling this. Uh, very clear details what everybody is expected to do. Uh, details for the patients uh, when the patients arrive. There was a whole process about somebody screening them in, in PPEs, looking at them, taking their temperature, doing a further screening process to see if they're COVID risk. Then in theatre, and I know that all the surgical, there's been a lot of um, workshops and examination to do with uh, surgery. Um, and in terms of the safety of different patients and the uh, masks and so on and so forth, we looked into all of those things and we introduced all those guidelines, which are interestingly get modified and we review these on a daily basis, looking at the risks, stratification, looking at the equipment that we have, looking at what is best practice uh, nationally and internationally, and then basically bring the patients on and fix the, the fractures. Next slide, please. So it's, this is a really important thing to, to highlight is that uh, it changes all the time. So there's a management group in the hospital, there's communication between the consultants from the different hospitals, between the different departments, and obviously, overriding all of this is medical and infectious diseases. Um, to, to be quite honest, the, 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 uh, a lot of it has rotated around the fact that anesthesia are very much in the firing line here, and they're very much uh, facing the patient in the, in the closest way. So we, we have the meetings in the morning and in the evening to go through the cases that are on, what has happened, has everything been satisfactory, and everybody is involved in looking after the patient, has an input, although there are very few people who attend it for, for obvious reasons. Um, the anaesthetic time is long. The patients that we would often treat with ankle fractures who'd be young people who would have general anaesthetics, instead they don't. They have spinal uh, anaesthesia. We use regional anaesthesia for upper limbs. Um, we uh, stack the list so that the upper limb surgeons lists are populated with upper limb fractures. The foot and ankle surgeons, when their lists are on, we stack up the, the complex lower limb or foot and ankle fractures. And for this reason, I think the quality of care in terms of fracture fixation is actually very high. Um, and we take hip fractures. So we initially had to get in equipment for that. And we did a very routine, straightforward hip fracture, which went well. And now we are quite comfortable about taking on more hip fracture patients. Um, we are staying, next slide, uh, Kieran, please. So these are all the sorts of resources that we've used and everybody's familiar with this and looking at things online and webinars and uh, seminars and and everything which have been very useful sometimes when there's slightly conflicting information it it can be problematic and 
we are like the world. We are having that intra hospital discussion about masks and where they should be worn and who should wear them and how often and so on. Um, and I guess we, we use it when we uh, can't <coughs> distancing is when we tend to use masks. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So the change in theatre, this quick snapshot of March the 12th, which was um, the day uh, it was announced that the schools were closed. There's a typical Kappa list with loads of hips, loads of knees, loads of feet, foot and ankle. Just next slide. Next slide, Kieran. <coughs> So, and there is our list today, which is a whole series of uh, fractures, ankle fractures, uh, uh, upper limb fractures. And you'll see that there are different surgeons coming in there. And some of them are not traditionally in, um, in the, uh, in, on the Kappa staff. They are, um, sorry, excuse me. They are uh, from uh, different hospitals, but they come along and they treat patients from their own hospitals or from any hospital. So we have this setup that uh, the patients come along from any hospital and we allocate them as per part of their body that's affected, not uh, as per what hospital they're referred from. So next slide. So we're down to, we are running currently, to, and there's an example of the audit of the cases performed in the first week. So you can see there were 49 cases done by a variety of different surgeons. We still preserved some urgent elective cases, which if you like were recurring dislocating hips or periprosthetic fractures or septic arthritis or locked knee or some of the cases that Dave referred to. So these were all audited and we reviewed them and we, we, uh, uh, we have arranged very careful follow-up and very careful scrutiny of their, of their care. Next slide, please. So outpatients, I won't dwell on this. Uh, Dave has already talked about that. Every clinic that we're, there are several clinics in Kappa every day. Um, they've all been cancelled, uh, but now all the patients' charts are reviewed during those clinics. Post-op patients have been phoned to assess over the phone. Patients who are waiting for blood results or scan results are phoned and given their review. Any urgent patient who does require actual clinical review, it is arranged for them to attend. Right, next slide. <coughs> Teaching, we've kept teaching going using Zoom, arthroplasty teaching, research meeting, journal club, audits. The focus obviously has changed a little bit towards uh, trauma management, but we are still keeping uh, some of the uh, ongoing uh, teaching with regard to elective orthopedics. Slide. So the take home message, and again, what, what I would say is it, it, it is something that is changing by the day. Uh, yesterday, we had, during the week, we had some issues related to staff unavailability and uh, people being contact traces and, and being uh, uh, quarantined and so on. So we ran two theatres for long days. Um, we are so we are staying open now 24 hours a day. We're going to work over the weekend uh, or bank holiday Monday. And fr so Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there will be lists going to look after trauma. We haven't had uh, a case, an emergency case out of hours but we have everything prepared that we can do that. Um, we, everybody realizes at this stage that something that set up can change very quickly after a few hours. And that, that took a little bit of time, but everybody understands. I think that we're very fortunate in, in Kappa, and I have to pay uh, to acknowledge what Peter Kyo and Paul Curtin, my two colleagues who are the real leaders in Kappa in terms of uh, working on this. And uh, also to acknowledge the anesthetic department and the nursing department not just in theatre, in that they all have just bought into this. Um, in fact, it affects, you know, everything. And I think everybody looking at working in the health service would say this about everybody from the people cleaning up, from the uh, catering staff, the portering staff, everybody has played such an important role. And it really is, once you're communicating with people, I think they are, they are likely to, to be much more uh, productive and much more helpful. But it does require ongoing review all the time. And this is what we're doing. Uh, this is, we expect it to get busier. We expect to get more of the hip fractures. We expect that uh, it may even get to the stage where ambulances will be triaging patients and possibly will be bringing them straight to Kappa rather than going to the emergency rooms in the general hospitals. A lot of this is led by what is uh, the demand in the general hospital. And as their capacity 
diminishes. And as their ability to deal with with uh, any level of, of trauma diminishes, then I think our role will increase. But so far, we it has been working well. Uh, it needs to be monitored all the time. There are certainly some issues that, that we could do better and that we're improving on. But overall, I, I, I think that uh, we are we're happy with how it's going and we think it is a good template for how a hospital can rejig itself. So thank you very much. Well, John, thank you very much for that. Um, that some fantastic uh, a framework there, I think, for many hospitals to look at and how they've uh, adapt to the situation and uh, and uh, provide service. And um, a couple of questions, and again, I'll remind everybody who's on the call that we're using the chat function. So if you want to type in your question to the panel, by all means, go and, and do so. But we have a few questions here that have come in. Um, I guess one question uh, that people are, have asked in this is, what um, what ways have you had to modify uh, the, the approach to your uh, operations in, uh, in in the midst of the COVID uh, um, outbreak? Uh, well, okay, so I can definitely answer that question. We have um, there are uh, we've looked at fractures now in a, in a slightly different way, and while I explained that um, all the fracture fixation is of the highest quality. We have a lower threshold for treating patients closed. So in other words, we have, would have fractures that are undisplaced that we would now treat in a cast, whereas I think probably we, we might have uh, opened and fixed some more of them. And there's a few different reasons for that. One is uh, sometimes the COVID status is not fully known. Uh, other times uh, it is to do with pressure on general anesthesia or regional anesthesia. So as regards doing the surgery, I think most of the differences have been with regard to anesthesia uh, rather than the actual surgical treatment. Once we decide to treat them surgically, um, we go ahead and fix them pretty much as we did. Although there are some guidelines from other countries that suggest you should use power tools a little less. Uh, and even that's, that's sort of conflicting um, information with regard to whether the bone, um, the aerosol generated by power tools on bone there's conflicting information as to whether there's any risk to do with that at all. So in general, we're fixing the fractures as we would otherwise, or we are treating them conservatively, which is closed. Thank you. The, the other kind of element of that is, has there been any changes to the use of uh, PPE um, and their use in theatre uh, as a result of the, the current situation? Uh, well, certainly for anesthesia, there's been a huge change in the use of PPE. and um, we are using uh, masks and visors, uh, but we're not using the highest level of PPE when we're operating on a routine patient. And in fact, one of the UK um, large elective orthopedic hospitals contacted us because they're doing the same. But in fact, what they're doing is they're dividing patients into uh, green or red. And red, they are COVID or they just are COVID positive and they wear the full gear, every single thing, or they're green and they don't wear anything different. I guess we're treating a lot of them as amber and we're wearing something in between when we're operating on them. But the anaesthetists are, are wearing the PPE for sure. And there's a whole process of, you know, extubating the patient, obviously, in the, in the operating theatre. And we're all outside there. And then there's a whole thing to do with air exchange and that before anybody goes back in. So there's much longer time to uh, turn over between cases. But we are particularly sympathetic and patient about all of that. Thanks, John. Um, David, I might ask you uh, the next question, um, which I guess, and we've had a, a very interesting uh, point from uh, uh, Professor McNamara and on the clinical programs uh, and surgery side, where, you know, we see that they, uh, they already, the waiting lists and day case waiting lists are increasing uh, significantly uh, as a result of all the cancellations, as you'll imagine. Um, but I guess we're going to have to get into some sort of way of prioritizing uh, these uh, unmet needs that are going to be, arise now over the next couple of weeks. And uh, can you tell me how the how the program might go about uh, assessing and advising uh, hospital groups and how to deal with that? I think that it's very dependent on individual people's practices, whether it's to do with um, arthroplasty, failing joints, uh, patients in severe pain from arthritis, um, people who have uh, infections, uh, spinal patients who have uh, either severe pain um, or uh, nerve root or 
spinal cord compromise. And then there's the patients with uh, long standing um, uh, degenerative knee pain. You know, the, the difficulty will be, uh, I think, not having patients to operate on. We'll have plenty of those, but having facilities and staff. And I suppose we'll have to see what priority the, gov the government gives us um, to uh, resource those patients. Are they going to be broke? Are they going to have lots of money available? I don't think the latter is the case. Um, but I, I think that all we can do is ask people to uh, see who are their most urgent patients now, because it would be good if people were able to uh, be ready to rock, if, if I can use that term, that as soon as uh, the elective or planned services are switched on again, that uh, people are ready to go in each individual hospital and that they've, um, you know, they've already, if possible, had patients pre-assessed if they need pre-assessment so that it's clear um, that uh, as soon as the opportunity is there, they can get going again. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, we've got a question in next year from uh, a, a colleague uh, down south and how basically uh, they're having to debate over the use of laminar flow in theatre and they were just wondering um, how has that been resolved, say, in CAPA? You need to unmute yourself, John. So uh, we have been using laminar flow and we're using it even between after the patient is intubated and extubated, there's a 10 minute period. And even that's controversial to some extent as to where is that air going when you exchange the air? Is it just blowing it to some other part of the complex? Um, there, there is a controversy about it, but we have continued to use uh, laminar flow. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and and uh, John and David are both, it's, I suppose it's, it's, I was just myself just curious, said, uh, what volume of the current need is being met by uh, moving everything into Kappa right now? And as you said, as, as the pressures come on the other hospitals, you'll start to see more and more pressure. And is it time for other regions of the country to start considering uh, identifying units similar to a Kappa in, in, in their areas? Uh, I, I think that it is important to have uh, a youth ready to increase its capacity. My impression is that there are hospitals around the country and in Dublin that can still accommodate their fractures and look after that. Um, and I guess we, we sort of set ourselves up as an insurance policy that uh, could be used, if you like, or a resource that could be ramped right up. Um, and we're ready for that and we can ramp it right up and we could do much more. Uh, we're, we're taking from some hospitals that are affiliated to Kappa, we're not taking any of their trauma because they are able to to deal with it themselves. Uh, whereas we are taking trauma from some of the hospitals that are not traditionally affiliated to Kappa. So it's very much hospital dependent. And I guess like everybody else, I hope that we don't end up taking all the trauma because I hope that all the general hospitals keep going along as as they are at this stage where they, they, it, it seems to be manageable and it does seem as if those patients that are medically quite frail, uh, when we say, will you treat that in your own hospital, to, to date it hasn't arisen that they've said we are incapable of doing that. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. It's been relatively straightforward. Kieran, if I could come in there, I think that around the country in places like Waterford, um, Galway, uh, other places are availing of facilities in local private hospitals um, to decant some of their uh, less frail patients um, for orthopaedic surgery there. And I think that that will probably increase around the country uh, so that local arrangements um, have been made between uh, different traumas, trauma units around the country with adjacent private facilities. Thanks. And actually, that's interesting. And as you mentioned, uh, the, the frailer patient, we've had a, a question here uh, that given the fact that a lot of people are cocooning and um, so that the actual the, the people who are having uh, the low velocity fractures are actually even more medically frail and therefore need a, need a, a bigger input from medical and uh, geriatric input. Um, and I'm just wondering, is this is this what we're seeing emerging at the moment or have you seen that yourselves? Uh, we have we've seen a huge change in the sort of range of people who are getting hip fractures. Um, and, you know, even from the very outset, what, what would trigger um, 
patients like that being transferred from general hospitals, if you like, is if and when they reach that point where they say, OK, we have better resources than the smaller private hospital or elective hospital. But at this point in time, those resources are so overwhelmed that this patient, even with all their comorbidities, would be better and safer in a hospital with less resources, but that's not so overrun. And that, that point is triggered by the general hospital. It's not triggered by the receiving hospital. It's at that point where they say, we, we can't manage with these anymore. So yes, we realize you don't have orthogeriatrics. We realize you don't have inside, on-site nephrologists and endocrinologists. We know all of that, but even allowing for that, this patient is likely to have a better outcome because we are so overcome. And that, that point, thankfully, has not arrived yet. You, you're mute. Hello, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm only an amateur at this. I haven't quite, uh, quite got the hang of it. Um, but the uh, it was getting near 10 past seven now and I'm conscious of everybody's time. And But there's a lot of interest here. Um, and I guess the one question that might be very useful for us all to understand and, and well done on keeping the teaching going, because I think a lot of trainees in all specialties are wondering how, how they're going to keep uh, learning, how with elective procedures gone, how they're going to stay on track. And um, one of the areas, of course, is that during redeployment, they will, of course, gain valuable clinical experience uh, uh, in, in other jobs in, in the hospitals. How would, would you advise them, say, to document that and how best to uh, kind of keep the, the teaching and the learning that's there and have that looked uh, recorded, I guess? Um. Well, well, in, in we are recording everything that happens. It's all recorded in the same way. Um, we're auditing it. We're uh, recording the outcomes. One of the things that's really important, obviously, with regard to um, uh, follow-up of patients is that there's a very clear pathway. So at the op note, it's very clearly identified exactly what that patient needs to do. One of the other things that I, I should have mentioned during my talk is that we're doing plastic surgery as well. We've accommodated the plastic surgeons here for their... Uh, trauma and but significantly also for their skin cancers. So that has opened up a whole system where we have to be particularly vigilant and particularly careful that all those biopsies and histology samples, because they're patients from Beaumont or Connolly or the Matter, they're being done in Kappa by different orthopedic by different plastic surgeons. And the results are they're going to the lab in the matter. So there's a whole process that we need to be very, very robust with and very, very careful about uh, to follow that up. Um, and I, I guess, is is that the sort of question? Is that the kind of, is that what you were asking? I, yeah, absolutely. No, John, it was just, it was, and the importance, I guess, of, of recording all of these activities and uh, ensure that they're there on the portfolio. And uh, just to mention that the, the college is going to try and find a way that uh, kind of a, a template that trainees, as they get this other experience that outside of, say, their normal work, they can actually record it. And that will all be taken into account, I guess, during CAP assessments and, and ARCPs and so on. And that, that's it. And um, the, the, the final uh, uh, kind of comment I make, which is a, a very good comment from one of our colleagues, is that there is a, obviously a, a role for um, uh, uh, our allied health professions. I, I think, David, in particular, you've been a huge advocate in the use of our physiotherapists in supporting perhaps even the virtual clinics and things like that. Um, and uh, how do you think that should work in other hospitals? Yeah, I think that that is something we've we've been very much trying to encourage our colleagues in um, the different um, health and social care professions, whether it's advanced nurse practitioners or physiotherapists or occupational therapists. Um, again, in some hospitals, they have been uh, redeployed, so our teams are fragmented somewhat. But I think it's important to remember that um, they, they will be of great assistance in getting the system up and running again. And it's very important that we um, retain and regain their expertise as soon as possible. Um, we, we all appreciate how much work uh, they put in and how dependent we are on them. Um, and it, we shouldn't lose sight of that uh, because now we don't see them as much because the workload in our specialty has reduced. But we will need them back as soon as possible. They will be invaluable. OK, well, look, uh, I'm going to bring the webinar to an end. I just want to particularly thank uh, the president for the opening remarks and our two speakers um, Mr. David Moore and Professor John O'Byrne for uh, an excellent uh, uh, presentation on, on what's going on in orthopedics. 
and uh, and for answering all the questions. I hope people found it informative and useful. And um, it's, it's incredible to see such great leadership in the specialty and uh, all the, uh, the the quick adaptability that's there. I mean, it's a testament, I think, to all of Irish surgery that uh, people are able to adapt and just find solutions where it's there and, and keep up that uh, culture. Um, and uh, there's nothing more for me to say, only to again, thank you to all the speakers. To thank the, uh, I sound like a radio uh, DJ here now, but to thank the um, uh, production team in the background that make all this work, uh, Erica and Parik and Paula and Adina and so on, and everyone in Surgical Affairs. And just to wish everybody a very happy Easter. Um, I'm not sure there's much chocolate left in anyone's house. I'm sure that the Lenten uh, um, uh, promises have all been broken with the uh, being locked up so much. Um, but uh, do have a good Easter. Um, and as I say, stay at home, wash the hands and stay safe. And we'll talk to you next week. Thank you.